This is Support is Sexy, episode 103, with the small biz lady, Melinda Emerson. Welcome to the Support is Sexy podcast. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, producer, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I talk to women entrepreneurs who share their journeys and the true stories of their wins and their lessons and give you insight and inspiration to take your business and your life to the next level. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. This is Elaine, and I am so excited to have you here because, as you know, it just would not be the same without you. So today I am thrilled out of my mind about our guest today. I mean, if you're going to have a podcast about women and entrepreneurship, who better to speak to than the small biz lady herself, Melinda Emerson. Now, Melinda and I have known each other for mm, six years, six or seven years now. We worked together, or I brought her in as an expert, I should say, when I was working at Black Enterprise, and I've been watching her ever since, and fortunate that she's been watching what I'm creating ever since, and it's been wonderful to see her brand continue to grow. So if you haven't heard of Melinda, just go to Twitter and go to the hashtag smallbizchat. She owns that and does that every Wednesday, talking about small businesses with other experts and providing answers to questions and all kinds of great stuff. So she is a phenomenal guest. I'm so excited to have had her and to get information from her and to hear how she became the small biz lady, which is a fascinating story in and of itself. So on this episode, you'll learn the biggest mistake that Melinda made in business Also, what happens when you no longer love the business that you've created? I've been there, so this is a great story. Why writing a book, a good book, helps position you as an expert. Also, what to do when life and business throws you a curveball. How to market yourself and build your brand effectively on social media, which Melinda knows a lot about. As I mentioned, the small biz chat, but also her blog reaches millions of people each week. So you want to listen out for that. The importance of repurposing content, why quality content always rises to the top, smart reasons to separate your brand from your name, the top five reasons small businesses fail, and why I'm pushing Melinda to start her own podcast. I mean, she said it was already in the works. I totally believe her, but I can't wait to hear what she creates if she does decide to go ahead and create a podcast. So to see all of the resources that Melinda mentions in this episode and the giveaways that she mentions, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com, search Melinda, M-E-L-I-N-D-A, and you'll be able to go to the links and see all of the great things and people, as I said, resources that she mentions there. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Without further ado, Melinda Emerson. So, Melinda, thank you so much for joining us on an episode of Support is Sexy. You know, I'm thrilled to have you here. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm so happy to see how you have evolved and blossomed as your own media personality. It's like so cool. Thank you so much. Now, the first question I ask everyone, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? You know, I was a sophomore in college and the first journalist I ever saw start a business launched her business, and you may be familiar with her. Her name is Oprah Winfrey. And literally, Oprah started Harpo Studios while I was in college and started producing her own creative product. And I was, like, enamored by this woman's business acumen. And, you know, there's a lot of people that get inspired by Oprah for a lot of different things, but I was inspired by Oprah's business gangsta, you know, and started following her back then, uh, you know, summer of 92. She got on my radar and she changed my life because because of her, I started thinking about entrepreneurship, but because of her, I started thinking that I could do entrepreneurship. Like I knew that one day I would own my own production company because I saw her start her own production company. So it really, um, that was the first time it ever popped into my head and I, it never left. I love that. And I'm, I'm with you. I mean, then and now just looking at what she's done as a businesswoman and including all the other things, but just as a businesswoman, it's just wow. It's a, an example of what's possible. 
It is. And it's an example of what she always says about how God can dream it bigger for you than you can dream it for yourself. And it's absolutely true. And she's always surrounded herself with smart people. And that's why she wins. Mm -hmm. Now, what was a young Melinda like as a little girl? You know, I was so serious as a little girl. I couldn't wait to become an adult. I mean, even... I think by the time I got to be about 11 or 12, I was wearing little women's business suits. Like I was (laughs) like, like I had banned, you know, Easter dresses, you know, your mom used to do you, you know, going to Easter, you would go get this new dress. And I finally got to the point where I was like, listen, can you take me to the petite women's department? Cause I need a suit. Um, (laughs) So I I have been serious my whole life um, and, you know, just could not wait to get out of high school to become a a quote unquote adult. So now outside of Oprah, which came along later, what were some of your greatest influences growing up? You know, I have to say my mom was my greatest influence growing up. And and it's funny because when I was a kid, I was an absolutely spoiled, rotten daddy's girl. I, I have three younger brothers. I'm the only girl. I'm the oldest. So it was, you know, me and my dad against the world. Um, and I really didn't give my mom a lot of a lot of, uh, of, I didn't pay her a lot of attention, you know, because I was like, my dad was my son and my moon and I was his son and his moon, you know, but in reality, when I think about the woman who inspired me most to be an entrepreneur, it's actually my mom because she was a stay at home mom until I was 10. And so she had all these hustles, right? So she sold Tupperware, she sold copper, she sold Metaluca, she took classes at the local community college and learn how to reupholster people's furniture. She made people's prom dresses. I mean, like, I just remember all these businesses my mother had. And, you know, she would drag us with her to help her set up her table to sell her stuff, you know, and, and it's crazy because my mom was the one that I always kind of gave short shrift to. But in fact, it was my mom who was the entrepreneur, but my dad was a career salesman. So I got the best of the both of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I could always see an opportunity. My dad could sell ice to an Eskimo, you know, and so out pops, you know, me. And I am a gregarious salesperson. I love <laughs> the customer. Um, and so that is that is what you get uh, from a, a serial entrepreneur mom. Now talk about how you sort of led into this, how those two things play into who you are as an entrepreneur today. Well, I believe that we are all products and victims of our environment, right? So I think I learned from my mom, you know, that you could go out and make your own money and that you should never really be dependent on anyone. And then from my dad, I just learned the gift of being able to read people and to recognize that you should honor all people. Like my father used to say, look, you can take the word out of a fool's mouth and make a million dollars from it. So you honor all people. He used to warn me about making sure that I spoke and acknowledged cleaning people and security people, you know, people that people walk by and don't speak to. He said, because the cleaning lady is going to hear somebody plotting against you and tell you. And sure enough, uh, years later in my second job, you know, there was somebody plotting my demise and it was a cleaning lady who pulled my coattail and said, look here, they trying to do something to you. You really? watch it. Yes. And I was able to get another job before they came for me, you know. So, again, um, you know, my father was just one of these people who did not believe in judging a book by its cover and believing that you should always be in a position to learn something. You know, if you know everything already, you in trouble, he used to say. So um, I, I can just think about the two of them and how they operated in life and in their careers and how that has affected, you know, me and my brothers. Now, when you uh, after you finished high school and went on to school, where did you go to school? I went to Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech. Oh, I went to Hampton. You were close by. All right. I spent <laughs> a lot of time. We drove a lot of weekends over to there. Ham- mm-hmm. <laughs> what were you doing over there at Hampton? 
Oh, well, you know, there was some little naughty head boy. Up there. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, what did you did you think um, at that time you would ever be an entrepreneur? Was that even though, you know, you had seen it a lot growing up from your mom and as you said, witnessing Oprah during those years. But did you have entrepreneurship on the brain or what did you think was going not to at happen? all? Not at all. I mean, I wanted to be a foreign news correspondent. I was in school. I was a journalism major, broadcast journalism, but I also did print. Um, you know, had my own radio show on campus. I was hardcore into journalism and I got my dream job when I got out of college. You know, my second job in the business, um, I got to work in Philadelphia, number four television market in the country. I was making as much money as my dad. I was 23 years old. You know, I was like living the life, mm -hmm. but, but I got my dream job and I hated it. I worked with the meanest people. I did work that did not fulfill my soul. And then I got a chance to work every Christmas for five years. And I was like, you know what? This is not working. This is not for me. I'm going to give these folks their job back and I'm going to figure out something else. And that was in 1999, 17 years ago. I had a laptop, a fax machine and a dream. And I came home and started my company that I have now, Quintessence Group, in the basement of my house. And that is how I did it. That's how I lived my life. Wow. So it was really being um, fed up, if you will, with that position that you were in at that time. And you decided, you know what, I'm going to try to create something on my own. Yeah. I mean, I was working 70, 80 hours a week for people who did not value me and didn't appreciate me. And I was like, you know what? <laughs> and I was young enough that I recognized that if I stayed in that environment, I was going to start acting like all of those people. And I was like, okay, I got to get out of here. Um, so I, what would a video production, you know, what would a television producer do but start a video production company? So that is what I did. And I knew how to tell great stories, but I didn't necessarily know how to run a business. So the first year or two I was in business, I took every course that they had in the city of Philadelphia to help you learn how to start a business and uh, business plan courses and the Prudential Young Entrepreneurs Training Program. And, you know, the SBA had a program. And there was this and that in the Enterprise Center, which is a big small business uh, incubator here in Philadelphia. I became the unofficial mayor of that building, you know. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things that I did to educate myself. The good thing is, is that I was a journalist, so I knew how to research topics, right? So I just turned starting a business into the best research, you know, documentary I could have ever done with myself being being the test uh, test dummy, if you will. So um I later on, once my business became successful, what I realized is that, you know, I would have run my business better if I had had better advice. You know, there were lots of people, there were lots of courses I could take about how to write a business plan. There were lots of courses you can take on, you know, leadership and how to be a better leader. But how to make payroll is something nobody can teach you until you got to make payroll. Mm hmm. How to handle a difficult client is something that you don't learn until until you have to deal with a difficult client. You know how to fire your best friend is something you don't learn until you have to do that. And so I realized along the way that one of the most valuable things in my business really literally was what I learned from running it. And that is what made me write my international best-selling book, Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months, which I uh, wrote in 2008 and was later published in 2010. But I wrote it for that very reason. Like, there's all kinds of advice out here, but the advice you really need, nobody's really going to tell you. They're going to let you learn that the most expensive way. And I wanted to try to mitigate people's learning curve as they started their business. That's so important. And, and just can you speak to how valuable that is for people now? Because at that time, when you were researching, you had to dig and find um, as much courses and information as you could, whereas now so much is available online, which is great. But then I feel like so much is available online, which is not so great because you can just get overwhelmed with information and not get the things you need about the real life experiences, as you mentioned, that's in your book, Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months. This is um, things that people might not necessarily even know to look for. Well, and I think business in itself is about figuring out what you don't know. Right. I mean, that, that's to me the definition of business because right. everybody has good ideas. Good ideas do not necessarily make good businesses. And so I think there's a lot that goes into it and you just don't even know the right questions to ask sometimes. And that's why I put together my book so, sort of to be sort of like the the 
the, the I don't know if you want to call it the, the, the real talk express of, of starting a business. You know, I've had people tell me that after they read my book, Become Your Own Boss in 12 Months, that they felt like a cold bucket of water had gotten dumped in their <laughs> face. And I said, well, you know what? I, I wanted to overwhelm you a little bit on purpose, but I also give you actionable steps at the end of every chapter so that it is not overwhelming to you. I break it down in bite-sized bits that you can do over a year. And if you follow my advice, I promise it'll be easier. And I have mounds and mounds of letters and emails from people telling me, girl, where were you? I'm so grateful I read this book. Or girl, where were you when I started my business 13 years ago? I needed you. You know, so <laughs> exactly. I, I know I'm wanting something. <laughs> yes, you are. And that's the thing. We don't know what we don't know, right? Until you read it somewhere and see it like, okay, I didn't even know that that was something I should consider or be aware of or remember not to do or to do. So it's important sure. to have, yes, go to guide, real talk guides like yours. Yes, I call it the, the straight talk express of starting a business. <laughs> exactly. Now, how did your business evolve from, as you mentioned, you started it more of a production company um, because that's the space you came from into what you have now as the small business lady. I mean, you were one of the first to get out there on Twitter as a small biz, biz lady. You still are the only small biz lady. You kind of own that, right? Yes, yeah. I am. The small business lady. You are yeah. the small, exactly. <laughs> so how did it, how did your um, business evolve in that way in creating this sort of other brand for you? Well, you know, it, it all happened uh, because of the birth of my son. In 2005, um, my husband and I got pregnant with my son. And I basically went from being the worst workaholic you ever met in your whole life to being put on bed rest and unable to leave my house for six months. And in that time, I realized the biggest mistake I had ever made in business, which simply was, I built a business that couldn't run without me. So I had trained my customers, you gotta talk to Melinda. I had trained my staff, you gotta go ask Melinda. You know, so everybody would do anything I asked, but nobody proactively did anything. So the year that I was pregnant, I almost lost my entire business. And back then, my 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 husband and I both worked in the business full time. So no money coming in meant no money coming in. And we had this baby coming and it was a mess. Um, but what I will tell you is God is good because it was in those six months that I couldn't leave my house that I was sick as a dog, that I, I only gained 23 pounds the whole time I was pregnant. That explains to you how sick I was. Mm -hmm. Literally, I would just vomit in the driveway. It was terrible. Anyway, so um, I started writing down all the expensive lessons I had learned in my business. And that is what eventually became, you know, years later, my best selling book. But at the time, it was just like some notes I was scribbling because all I had was time. Because remember, in 2005, Wi-Fi was not what it is today. There was no wireless Internet. You could hook up to your computer and still be working. All you had was a cell phone that got a little bit of email to your cell phone. Like it was not, it, it, you know, I, I try to explain this to people all the time, like 2005, Wi-Fi didn't become big, what, till about 2008, really? Like when people were able to like have laptops everywhere and coffee shops and all this stuff. So you're talking about three, four years prior to that. I'm, I'm pregnant. I'm home. I'm trying to run my business. I basically had a Palm 3 cell phone. It, it, it didn't run wow. too well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was it was really crazy. But I started taking these notes and, and writing down stories, not just of the things I learned, but the things that I knew other people had learned. And that was what eventually when I, I got my baby born and I got him to his first birthday and I had built my company back up, I realized that I didn't love doing that business anymore and I didn't love doing it the way I had been doing it. I mean, basically my secret sauce was, oh, we gonna outwork everybody. You know, so you could call my office at nine o'clock at night and people would answer the phone like it was three o'clock in the afternoon. I had created this awful, you know, workaholic culture and I didn't have a life I don't even know how I got pregnant, truly. I mean, I, I just, yeah, like, all I did was work. I used to leave church on Sunday and go work four more hours in my office. Like, I was ridiculous. And like you, know? you said, it all depended on you. It's the whole kit and caboodle. I was the show and the business, okay? And it didn't work. And so I was like, I got to figure something else out. And literally, I started praying. And 
this was like 2007. And by this time, when I tell you everything was crazy, everything was crazy. So my business was was crazy. I mean, I had brought it back up out of the ashes, but we weren't rolling. Like, I mean, at one point, I was number 29 of the fastest growing small businesses in Philadelphia. I was on the Philly 100 list at number 29. That's how well I was doing. I was a finalist for the Black Enterprise Rising Star of the Year Award. Ebony Magazine had named me top 30 leaders under 30 in America. You know, state of Pennsylvania named me top 50 women in business in Pennsylvania. I mean, I was rolling. And then I went from that to ashes quickly. Wow. And it was like, okay, Lord, where are we going? Because I don't know. And I always know. Like, I'm one of these people. I'm a type A A overachiever. I like making lists because I like to cross them up. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a plan B, C, D, nothing. And I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And so started praying. And within two and a half, three months, God gave me a vision and a dream three times to become America's number one small business expert. Mm. Now, did you now you said three times did the first two times, because I know I've been guilty of this. You kind of say, well, that now that can't be it. Right. You, you know, like, oh, I don't yeah. know. That's not quite that's not exactly or that uh, you had built you up. <laughs> you had built up a, a different kind of business, too. I would imagine it was hard to be like, wait, change things up and go this other direction. Right. And then and then it was like, OK, Lord, let me get this straight. My business, my business is on life support. And you want me to go around and tell people that I am America's number one small business expert and that all should listen to me. That's what you that's what you that's what our big idea is, really. And you God know? was like, I'm going to tell you again for the second <laughs> time. And I'm going to tell you again for the third time. Yes. Right. And then by the third time, I was like, OK, I don't want him to strike me with lightning or anything. <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead on and be obedient. But I have to tell you those first, it took me about 22 months after I became the small biz lady. And, and I will quickly tell you that story even. So once I finally decided to be obedient, right, to this vision God had given me, I was like, oh, no, what am I going to do? And so the first thing I did was I joined the National Speakers Association and I went out to their national conference. And every single person I talked to said, listen. In order to be taken seriously as an expert, you got to write a book. Matter of fact, you got to write a good book. And if you're really good, somebody pay you to write it, you know. And 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 that actually encouraged me because I was like, well, I do have an undergraduate degree in journalism, so writing a book is not scary to me, right? You know, we just got to figure out what is it we're writing about, right? So once I realized that, and then I remembered all those notes I had written when I was pregnant. Now this is like two years earlier, right? So then I got to go back and find these journals I was writing in. And I said, wait a minute, I, I, I have a book, I, I think I can like cobble this thing together and make it a real book. And, and as as God would have it, I ended up on the phone one day with a book publisher talking about something that had nothing to do with this, by the way, mm-hmm. I was like complaining about something else. And the man said, well, you know, we would never release that product again unless we had a book connected to it. I said, oh, yeah, well, I got a book. Oh, yeah. What's your book called? And the original title of my book was How to Quit Your Job and Become Your Own Boss in 18 Months or Less was the original title of my book. And he was like, well, who's publishing your book? And I was like, well, nobody. I was going to self-publish it. And the guy was like, girl, <laughs> he, I mean, he looked at me. He did. He was on the phone. But you know how you could just hear somebody's attitude? In you the hear phone? it in the voice, right? He was like, listen why don't you send me your table of contents and four chapters of your little book and I'll let you know what I think about it. That's how he talked to me. Like I, like I was gum on the bottom of his shoe, but I was (laughs) all right. That's okay. (laughs) Was this a friend of yours? Somebody that. No, I didn't know this man from Adam's alley cat. I did not know him. I love it. Um, So I, I, I FedExed him my table of contents, my, my chapters and I put a media kit in there because by that time, you know, I had won all these awards and stuff. So I was like, let me tell you who you deal with, you know. Right. Just... So I sent it to him. And this was like Thanksgiving 2007. And I heard nothing the whole month of December. And I was like, he hates my book. You know, what am I going to do? And lo and behold, January 3rd, 20, 2007, my phone rang. I'm looking for Miss Emerson. This is she. This is Peter Archer from Blah Blah Media Company, and I wanted you to know that we liked your book, and we wanted to know, do you have any more chapters? 
And I said, yes, I have three more chapters. He said, well, clean them up and get them to me because I want to take you before the editorial board and get you a book deal. Wow. And that's what happened. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a book proposal. I didn't even know what those things were. I had an idea. And you put and you had the courage to put that idea out there and not say, oh, well, I'm working on something. I'll get it to you when it's done or complete or perfect or the, all the things that we put in the way of us and the possibility of making something happen. You no, s- I was the complete antithesis of that. I was a poking, uh, you know, Pinocchio liar about what I had. <laughs> right. I was, yeah, I got it. Uh huh. I got yeah. it in my head and I'm gonna get it to you. I got yeah. three more chapters for you. <laughs> wink, wink. Yeah, you know. Um, but, but as God would have it, um, I did get the book deal and, um, uh, my book was due to my publisher September 1st, 2008. Now, do you remember what happened about September 15th, 2008? Oh, yes. Man. Yes. The uh, world crashed. Right. The world crashed. People's 401ks yes. became 401ks. Remember that? Well, my publisher called me up and said, Melinda, thank you so much. So much for being a first time author that actually turned your book in on time. But we don't think anybody's thinking about entrepreneurship right now with all these people losing their jobs and, you know, the market crashing and everything. And I was like, wait a minute, let me get this straight. You you don't think anybody's thinking about entrepreneurship right now when people are losing their jobs? Really? You, nobody. You don't think nobody's thinking about entrepreneurship. Oh, no, no, no. And we want to bring your book out in a more favorable business environment. That's what they said. And I was livid. I mean, so much so that I was trying to go around my family and borrow money to buy my book back from my publisher. But of course, you know, the market had crashed. So nobody had an extra $10,000 to give me to buy my book back. (laughs) Right. Everybody's belt was tight around that time. And I was like, you know, I didn't have no, I, I, we were living off that, you know, it was just like, oh, you know, it was a mess. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because at this point I had wound down my video production company completely because I thought I was about to go on this national book tour. Mm-hmm. And the thing that was interesting about this is PBS was interested in doing a national pledge special based on my book. And that too went away in an instant because they were like, listen, we know how much money Dr. Wayne Dyer makes for us. And we know how much money Susie Ormond makes for us, but nobody has ever heard of Melinda Emerson. Mm -hmm. So good luck, kid. You know, basically is what they said to me. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. But I was obedient. But I did what he said. And he was like, "Mm mm-hmm. I still say it. <laughs> right. Now, how do you, that's a good, that's a good point. How do you stick to it during the, or how did you stick to it during that time? Listen, listen, it's only through God's goodness and mercy that I got through it. But I also had some amazing friends. So one of my dear friends in NSA said, Melinda, you know what? If I was you, I would hire a publicist and I would start publicizing that book like it was coming out anyway. And I was like, Really? She said, yes. Bill Gates said if he did $2 left in the world, he would spend $1 on PR. So what you got, $5? Call some people and get them to work, <laughs> you know, basically. So I hired a woman. Her name was Kathy Larkin, and she owned this company called WebSavvyPR.com. And I called her up, and I told her my sad story. I was like, listen, <laughs> they threw me under the bus. They won't publish my book. It's terrible. I'm like, I don't know what to do. And this woman on the other end of the phone, she said, great. We got 18 months to build your author platform. Now, you have to realize that was a term people did not use back then. Right. And I, she saw that as an opportunity. She was like, girl, we got 18 months to get the world proud for your book. Word up. This is going to be great. So then I was like, I literally thought I was talking to a crazy person. Though. <laughs> right. like, Cause I was like, what do you mean? This is great. Like, how could this be great? So then she said, I know what we're going to do. We're going to go out on Twitter and build your brand. And I said to her, what is Twitter? <laughs> Cause this what was 2008. This is 2008. Right. So this is the fall of 2008. So this Twitter was two years old. Nobody knew what Twitter was back then. 10 people that were using it, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I was like, what is Twitter? You know, and, 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 and that's hilarious to think about now. All right. But literally I, I, you know, she convinced me, Melinda, this is what we need to do. And I, and I didn't have no better ideas of fighters. So I said, okay, fine. So we went out on Twitter and the day came for me to get my own Twitter account. 
So I'm on the phone in front of my computer. She's on the phone in front of her computer. And literally, I put in my name, Melinda Emerson. And I get this notice back. This name is already taken. Now, what I need to explain to you is that I was one of those kids that could never find their name on the keychain, the keychain thing at the right. gas. Right. Yeah. You know, the kids. I think I've met five other adult Melinda's in my whole life. You right. know. So it was ridiculous that that someone else with my name had gotten to Twitter because I just didn't believe there was it was possible that anybody else had my name. Especially that early <laughs> on on Twitter. This wasn't like last week. Are you kidding me? Like so. But anyhow, long story short, we ended up as a joke going to Facebook and putting in the name Melinda Emerson to see how many there were. There were seven other Melinda Emersons, but I was the only black one. And I had already, by that time, I owned MelindaEmerson.com. So whoever they were, they weren't trying to become famous because I already owned like all the real estate around. <laughs> around the name. Yeah. So, but anyhow, my publicist was like, look, we got to come up with a nickname for you. I said, a nickname? You mean like Mindy or Melly Mel? <laughs> Melly Mel. And she said, no, fool, you are not a rapper. We're not going to give you a nickname like that. I was like, okay, so what do you got in mind? And she said, well, I think that we should come up with a name that tells people who you are and what you do. And I said, like what? And she said, how about Small Biz Guru? I said, you know, with my first book coming out, I'm not sure I'm quite bold enough to crown myself a guru just yet. Right. I don't want Michael Gerber to call me, you know, be like, oh, yeah, you the guru? Okay. <laughs> um. And then she said, well, how about small biz expert? You know, that's great keywords. I said, again, I believe it is for others to call you expert. I'm not so sure you need to call yourself one. And she was like, all right, all right, all right. She said, well, then how about small biz lady? And when she said that to me, I kind of got a quiver up my spine. I was like, you know, I think I could be her. That sounds about right. And so that was the day I became small biz lady. Wow. Who would have ever thought that 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 would have become the best branding thing that ever could have possibly happened to me. And now your audience on Twitter is well across social media is huge, but isn't it over 350,000? Just on Twitter, just on Twitter, but my Twitter, my reach uh, weekly is 3 million entrepreneurs a week online. Three million. So now after you got the name, what did you do? Because that was actually one of my questions. Um, what would you say were your first was your first step, obviously getting the name Small Biz Lady, but then in building that audience, especially with Twitter being so new at that time, what did she advise you? I know she gave you some ideas of what to do. Oh, yeah. She gave me a, like a, you know, homework, you know, so it was like she said, all right, Every day, there are three things that she wanted me to do. Number one, she wanted me to share an article that was helpful to small business owners written by somebody else, you know, Inc. Entrepreneur or New York Times, whatever, like something else that I found that was valuable. The second thing she asked me to do was share something personal about myself. So at the time, you know, I had a little baby, so I would tweet out stuff like, you know, had to act like an ape to get JoJo to eat a banana this morning, you know, something that would help people get to know me so that I didn't come off like some little business drone that just always tweeted out business links. And then I would answer somebody's small business question every day. And I did that Monday through Friday every day for about four months. And within four months, I realized I was spending so much time every day looking for people that had business questions that we were like, what if we could figure out some kind of way that we could make people with questions find me? And that was when we started to see that there were people out here who were doing tweet chats on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so four months in, in um, really March of 2009, I launched Small Biz Chat. And lo and behold, that is what really set my Twitter audience on fire. Because within six to eight weeks of starting uh, Small Biz Chat, and let me explain what that is for your audience members who don't know. I conduct a live weekly Q&A on Twitter every Wednesday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern. I've been doing it for seven and a half years. And I you know, bring on other small business experts, but I answer people's small business questions live every single week on the internet. And, um, it is something that, that made me known internationally, literally. Um, people 
email me with business questions. They DM me with business questions. They hit me on Facebook in my inbox with, with questions. You know, I have literally become the EF Hutton of small business because of small biz chat. And, um, and it's been incredible. I mean, we've had people on small biz chat as guests from all over the world, Australia, London, Ireland, um, all over the U.S., all kind of time zones. We've had to wake people up from Africa, from you know, from everywhere. Um, and it's become this amazing peer-to-peer mentoring program um, that, you know, for people basically to get free coaching on stuff they're struggling with. I love and, that. And it's hashtag small biz chat. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and the other cool thing that we realized after about three months of doing small biz chat, we realized that that it didn't make sense to just do it for an hour on Twitter, that we needed to give people a place where they could come and revisit the information. So about two months after I launched Small Biz Chat, I launched my blog, SucceedIsYourOwnBoss.com. And then about a month into that, we launched every Thursday, whoever was the guest on Small Biz Chat, we would publish the Q&A on my blog as, as information. And what we found was that the, the people who were our guests loved that because it, it got it was so much work to be on Small Biz Chat because, you know, I'm a former television producer, so I make it work now. I make sure that the content is high. Um, and so we were able to repurpose that information as a Q&A blog post, which people love because it gives them seven to ten more days of exposure and it lives forever on my blog. And now my blog is really big. So <laughs> back then it might not have seemed like something of value, but it's very valuable now. People stalk me to get on Small Biz Chat now. And that's so important, too. That, well, there's so many lessons in there. First of all, thank you for sharing that story. But uh, one of the things just most recently that you mentioned, this idea of repurposing your content and figuring out how to make it work across different different platforms. A lot of us spend so much time doing something and posting it one place and then doing something totally different in, not in another place. But what you have been masterful in doing is finding out how to make your content work across multiple platforms. Definitely. And, and it really was valuable. And it saved me some time because it saved me from having to write a one less fresh blog post a week. So I was like, word up, this is great. Right. Even though I am, even though I would love for you to do a podcast, but I know you have so much going on and new stuff in the works. So small biz, come with the small biz, small biz chat podcast. I'm looking for it. It is, it is coming closer than you know. It is right. See, it is coming. It's because people have been begging me to do a podcast for a couple of years. Yeah. Small Biz Chat is so much work. I was like, Lord, I can't do another thing. But I think I think you may you may hear the Small Biz Chat live podcast coming soon. Good. I, I mean, OK, good. Glad we're on the same page. That's all I'll say. Very good. Very good. Now, as you mentioned with your uh, with social media and the massive audience that you have there, especially on Twitter, you started back in, I guess, 2008, 2009, and you gave us the ways that you did that. Do you think a strategy like that could work for someone still today? Because things there's so many more people, obviously, on Twitter and people even trying to duplicate what you're already doing so well. Do you sure. think those strategies would still work or should people approach it in a different way? Well, I do think that the strategies can still work, but there is a lot. I mean, I think one of the things I benefited from was the fact that I was a pioneer. You know, there weren't there weren't five thousand tweet chats. There right. were there were three <laughs> back when I got started. You know, so um, I think that certainly someone could duplicate what I did and become an influencer and social media brand. Um, that I don't know that they could do it on Twitter though, because Twitter is slowing down. There's a lot of other new mediums out there. You know, you've got, uh, you know, Snapchat is becoming huge. You got Instagram, you got, you still got Facebook is still king. Don't get it twisted. You know, Facebook still has more users than everybody else. Um, but even Facebook is slowing down. That's why they're trying to steady, you know, have reasons to draw people back. So I think that, um, is it still possible to become a social media brand? Absolutely. Could you use the exact blueprint that I did? I don't know. But I will say this. Quality content always rises to the top. And the reason why my brand is still strong and relevant and from seven years ago to now is because I have never published a, a, a bad, irrelevant piece of content on my blog. I do not do it. And I think that um, you know, before we even knew what SEO was, there was good content. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I think if you always keep your content 
customer focus, reader focus. You cannot go wrong if you're actually helping people solve real problems for their business or their life. So um, I think this, my secret sauce to everything I've had the opportunity to do is my blog. You know, I've had the opportunity to be a columnist for Entrepreneur. I've had the opportunity to be a columnist for the New York Times. And in both cases, I was told those people had read my personal blog for six months to a year before they ever picked up the phone and called me. Um, there's plenty of speaking engagements I have gotten because somebody read something that I wrote, whether it was in Huffington Post or New York Times or wherever. So I think that, you know, great content that is valuable and relevant to people trumps all of it. Mm-hmm. Now, tell me, um, I'm just curious with your with your blog, Succeed Is Your Own Boss dot com. You own Melinda Emerson dot com. Did you think to why did you think to name your blog something else and not just go with your name? Because I knew one day I would sell it. <gasps> Genius. I, I love never, that. I never wanted to have the brand be Melinda Emerson dot com. And is that because of what happened years ago, uh, as you mentioned, with, with having your son during that time where it all of it revolved around you? Or was it just thinking well, it through? It was just I have always treated my blog like it was a business from the very beginning. It was never casual. It was never about my day. It was uh, it was always a business. I have over 3000 pieces of content underneath the hood of my blog. And I know that content is valuable. And I know that URL and how much positive incoming traffic to that URL is valuable. So I'm trying to build assets that are that are monetizable. Mm -hmm. So um, but I did I actually worked with a consultant in California when we were first when the book was just about done. um, I was trying to figure out if I wanted to do a book website or if I wanted to do a Melinda Emerson website. And and the advice that I got was you're going to write more than one book, so do not name your blog the title of your book because when you get tired of promoting that book, you're going to be stuck with that blog. Right. And the person said, and do not name it after yourself unless you plan to sell off your name and your trademark and everything to somebody one day. You always need to treat your blog like it is an asset. And um, and that is why I named it SucceedIsYourOwnBoss.com. Melinda, that is good advice. I feel like we can end it right there. I have a few more questions, though, but that is <laughs> so good. You got me thinking like, hmm. Write down on you. <laughs> what you say? You see me writing notes like, uh-huh. Yes. Very true. <laughs> Very good advice. Excellent. Of course. I didn't expect anything less. Now, one of the uh, part of your mission as small biz lady is to end small business failure. Right. Yeah. What would you say are the top three reasons that you've seen that most businesses fail or slip into that, get on that slippery slope, I should say, towards failure? Well, the number one reason why small businesses fail is because people do not think realistically about what their life is going to be like running their business. They do not realize that the average small business cannot pay themselves until year four of the business. They don't save enough money. For some reason, they think that they're going to have more time when they start a business. And that's just really not true. Eventually, it'll be true, but not initially. Um, You know, it takes 12 to 18 months for a small business to break even, let alone replace your corporate salary. And people don't save enough money. They don't you know, they just don't have a realistic timeline for how long it's going to take. And they just aren't willing to recoil their lifestyle enough to 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 put everything they have into this business. And it's hard. A lot of businesses fail. But a lot of businesses are helped to failure by people with unrealistic expectations. Um, The second reason why small businesses fail is because 90% of all small businesses get business from referrals and from their personal network. And it is astonishing to me how often people with no friends will start a business. It is amazing. It's like, you know, you're bad at keeping in touch with people. You don't return people's phone calls. You don't send out holiday cards. Like, you know, it's almost like when you're a little kid, if you want friends, you must be friendly, right? If you want customers, you better reconnect with your friends 12 months before you need them. The last thing somebody who hasn't heard from you in three years wants to hear is from you trying to sell them something or worse, trying to get you, them to, trying to get them to sell for you. It's like, don't do that. Be a friend. I mean, seek to help first. If you seek to help first, people will always help you. And, and that is true. I can tell you that that is true is, is the day is long. Because when I started as a small biz lady, I didn't try to sell anybody anything for 18 months. All I did was help. Mm-hmm. All I did was give. So when I did need something, 
people broke their necks to help me. People called me and begged me, could they please review my book? I was like, wow, really? You know, people sharing my content off my blog. The first day I had six comments on my blog, my very first blog post. That doesn't happen. Usually you have to blog six to 12 months before anybody pays any attention to you. And that's because you had provided so much value. I think the quote, um, Zig Ziglar, I think is a quote that if you want to get what you want, help people get what they want. Absolutely. If you do their stuff, they'll do your stuff. I mean, it's it, the law of reciprocity, but it's, but it's also just, just common sense. It's like you have to give to get. Mm-hmm. And that is what, that is what social media is all about. But that's what life is all about too. I mean, who wants to be around a bunch of takers all the time? Nobody. You know what I mean? So for me, um, you know, my mission is to end small business failure. And that's a mission that God put on my heart. Mm-hmm. Um, and everything I do is about that because I realize there's lots of good ideas out here, but most people have absolutely no idea how to run a business. And that's where the trouble lies. Um, but back to your question, the third reason why small businesses fail is because people spend so much time chasing new customers as opposed to nurturing existing customers. It's like you need to love on people who've already said they love you as opposed to going out and chasing every analyst that you think running down the street has money hanging from it. I mean, the first sale you make is always going to be the most expensive sale. So you need to make sure that you are nurturing people who already have bought from you because repeat repeat business is sustainable business. And if I could just add a fourth and fifth one. Yes. Um, the the fourth reason why small businesses fail is because people will not niche. They believe that everybody can use my product or service. And that is a lie. You know, the two things that every small business has is limited time and limited resources. So you need to pick a marketing target that you can actually hit. Um, and the fifth reason, and this is probably the most deadly reason, if you don't manage your household with a budget, you will not manage your business with one. And successful businesses are run based on up-to-date financial information. You cannot let your fear of math be the reason why you don't know what's going on in your business. Right. Even in the simplest way, keeping track of your budget. Absolutely. You shouldn't spend two dollars in a vending machine that's not in a budget. And I mean that particularly in the early days of your business, because your business is going to need every dime. So wasteful spending can't happen anymore. You got to be zero debt. You can't be. I mean, obviously, you're not going to pay off your house. You know, you might still have some student loans, but like other stuff, credit card debt, you know, car debt. mm -mm, No, there's zero, zero, all that stuff. And you got to have good credit because you are your business's credit. Mm -hmm. I mean, even right now, I couldn't walk into a Staples without somebody pulling my personal credit to get a little Staples credit card. Right. Everything you try to do is all it's all related, especially for small businesses. Absolutely. Now, in June, you mentioned that um, keynote that you did at the National Speakers Associate Association, excuse me. And you mentioned that um, one of the things that you realized was we're all one idea away from being able to do anything we want. Yes. yes. What, what do you, how do we know that? Let's see. How do I say? How do we know that it's the right idea? Because as you even as you mentioned earlier, you got this voice from God, if you will, three times had to tell you, look, no, this is what you're supposed to do. So how so many of us have ideas. And as we said, ideas really mean nothing. It's all about execution. How do we know that we're on to the right idea? Well, you validate it. Right. So you go and see, first of all, are there other people selling this? Because competition is validation. You know, I love it when people walk up to me. I don't have any competition. I'm ready to run from them. I'm like, yes, you do. Your customers being serviced some kind of way. You better figure it out. You also need to make sure that um, you have a real passion for it and that, you know, you could do it even if you had to do it for free. You know, so there's got to be that 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 passion test. And then there's got to be sort of like the smell test. OK, where are you going to get your your product from? What are you going to sell it for? Is there really somebody out here that's going to buy it? And the mom and them ain't enough of a representative sample to tell <laughs> you whether or not, you know, you actually have a viable business idea. So you've got to go out and validate it with multiple groups of people and find out what they're willing to pay and test it. You know, I do not believe in people quitting jobs to start a business. I believe in people being side hustlers first. So most of the businesses people are starting are, you know, e-commerce or professional service businesses. You can do that stuff on your evenings and weekends. 
So test stuff out before you leap and then look by leaving your job. I mean, some of us don't have a choice. Some of us get fired, get laid off, a package comes along that's too good to be true, take it. But if you have the luxury of still getting a paycheck, please learn on those other people's paychecks before you get out here and you got to pay the paychecks and learn all the lessons the harder way. Do not do that to yourself because you're just making it harder. Making it more stressful. That's such good advice. Now, what would you say as a woman, entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself? Huh. You know what? Entrepreneurship is a spiritual journey as much as it's anything else. And what it has taught me is I am capable of far more than I realize. That is what it has taught me. You will do whatever you have to. Have you? Did you ever have a moment within your career, because it's in your entrepreneurship, um, it's been, what, 17 years? How many yeah. years? Yes. Have you, have you ever had a moment where you thought about going back to a quote unquote full time job? I'm, obviously, I know entrepreneurship is like a double full time job. But have you ever had that that moment where you thought about that? Oh, sure. Sure. I, I had a time when I had resumes on the street. And you know, what's really funny is it was right before my book came out. Like, mm-hmm. like, like, I believe God a little bit, you know, I didn't believe him completely, you know. And I also had a spouse at the time who didn't believe in my vision, didn't believe in what I was doing and was sort of like, how many resumes you put out today? Uh, you know, I'm not married anymore. So that will tell you how that worked out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will tell you that it was hard in the very beginning trying to be obedient to an idea that wasn't generating any money for two years, did not generate any money. Money was going out no money was coming back in and on, on that idea. And, you know, with a marriage that was crumbling in the background and a brand new baby that was still, you know, not sleeping through the night, I felt like a crazy lady, you know, back then. But, but I also, I did believe God though, for his goodness. I did believe the vision and he showed me where I am now. So I, so I, you know, I had to, I had to be steadfast, but it was hard. I was tested in so many ways. I can't even tell you. Amen. I hear that. Thank you for sharing that. (laughs) Now, what would you say your support network is like now? Oh, I have amazing, uh, amazing support network. I mean, number one, I have um, a business coach. um, But two, I have personal mentors and I have professional mentors. So I have, you know, some older you know, sage folks in my life who be like, baby, <laughs> you know, it's going to be all right. You're going to be fine. You know, and then I have my mentors who are like, okay, what is your three year plan looking like? What are your projections for next, you know, the next two quarters? How are you going to negotiate with that contract to, to get your client to pay you faster? Blah, blah. Like, you know, I have, I have mentors that, you know, I should say, uh, you know, mentor my soul and the other ones that mentor my business operations and get on me about hiring more staff and getting a new assistant and all this kind of stuff so that I can become my best and and get my my five X productivity going. So. um, So, yeah, that's what I have around me. And I have some wonderful girlfriends who I get together with whenever I can. And we laugh very hard. So important. All three. Yes, yes, you got to have I tell people you got to have a team of mentors and and I I'm very fortunate that I have an amazing amazing village around me. Excellent. So in closing up, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? I would thank my mother. I would thank my mother because my mother made me tough as nails. My mother made me a boss chick and she knew I could handle the title. Um, I didn't understand what she was doing at the time. There were times when, Lord, I felt like she was the meanest person God ever put breath into. But what I realized now was that it was she who made me the woman and the mother and the business owner that I am today. My toughness and my empathy and my kindness um, came from her. And um, I would tell her that not everybody gets a good mom, but I sure got one. So I would thank her. And and I do thank her. I talked to her this morning. I thanked her. So. Oh, good. <laughs> good. That warmed my heart. I know how it is. Mom, nothing like mom. 
Girl. So, <laughs> nothing like I'm a daddy's girl too, but I'm mom. a daddy's girl, but there was a day when I woke up and I realized that nobody in this world loved me like my, my mama. mama. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, I had to get a clue. I had to apologize. I, I just sent my mama flowers sometimes just cause. Because at that time when you just didn't listen. It's a wonder I'm alive to tell the story. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> oh my goodness. So tell us how can we support you? you? You know I love supporting you, but how can everyone else support you? I'll have links to the website, all that good stuff, but tell us where to find you, social media, all that good stuff. Well, I am the small biz lady and that's capital S B and L all over Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram. I am Instagramming now. Finally, you guys have complained enough. I'll throw some pictures up there for you too. <laughs> Um, my blog succeedisyourownboss.com. I'm so excited. You know, December is my favorite time of the year, not just because it's my baby's birthday, but because I always do my 12 days of giveaways program. Oh, every I saw time. that. And so I want you to tell your listeners to go and sign up on my website. Even if you're on my email list, it doesn't matter. You have to sign up for 12 days of giveaways. And we had some amazing partners last year, Microsoft, HP, next Tiba staples and we got some of those guys and more coming back so y'all know i love to give away free stuff so y'all better go get signed up now is it just going to oh sorry go ahead you're going to give us the url yeah it's succeed as your own boss.com and um all over twitter and and and, uh facebook we put the stuff out there so that you guys know how to go and sign up perfect melinda thank you so much you're wonderful as you know always showing up with the good stories and the great information Well, I appreciate you and I'm just so excited for you and this podcast and anything I can do to support you, retweet you, put it out there. I'm I'm happy to do it. Thank you. And I can't wait for your podcast. I'm just going to say it again in whatever form that looks like. You know, you could do tiny. You didn't ask me, but I'm just going to say you could do even short, small biz, even if it's not a chat, like people are doing sort of quote of the day kind of thing. If I could get from you just a short every day whether it's five minutes or less, something about business, that would be enough. It doesn't even have to be a three hour, 30 minute, whatever interview with anybody. That that would be excellent from you if I knew every day, almost like a meditation, but not a meditation. Every day I can get a quick tip from Melinda Emerson, the small biz lady of something I needed to know as a woman entrepreneur or just as an entrepreneur. That would be plenty. I'm just saying. All right. I'm All just, right. Say, I'm just you saying. That, you might get that in video. <laughs> yeah, see? That- video yeah every day okay so i'm done that's what i'm not i'm not gonna button your bit that's what my mother always says to me i'm gonna get out of your business now after she's <laughs> after she's been all up in it and says whatever she had to say now i'm gonna get out of your business because <laughs> yeah, you didn't I ask know. me <laughs> my mother she, she's like the de facto coo of right of exactly. the enterprises she's so funny exactly so before you go lastly you gave us so much of advice but a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything you know, you never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. You wake up every day. There is definitely always a lesson to be learned. But there is no lesson to be learned dwelling on failure. Failure doesn't even exist. It's about some lessons being more expensive than others. So remember, you never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. Excellent. Melinda Emerson, hold on just one second for me. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. And the challenge for you is to take at least one thing. You can always do more than one thing, but take at least one thing and incorporate that into your business today. Take action today. Also, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com to get more information about this episode and to see previous interviews that I've done with other fantastic women entrepreneurs. And while you're there, be sure to go to the free resources button so you can see what kind of resources I'm offering to you guys. Right now, it is a three-part audio training on how to make brave decisions. The decision to do something is sometimes scarier than even the actual doing. So go Go to supportissexypodcast.com, go to the top, click free resources and download that free audio training. All right. So thank you so much again for listening. Until next time, you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.